All right, so our next guest on virtual live stage is Paul Mitri. He's the VP of Regulatory Affairs at NADA. Paul helps franchised auto dealers navigate the regulatory maze that's affecting auto dealers all across America. With the new administration coming into Washington, this is a great time to catch up with regulatory affairs. Hi, Paul. It's nice to see you. It's a pleasure to be with you as well. Thank you. Let's get started. What does the presidential transition mean for dealers in the regulatory arena? Well, in any presidential transition, it's always going to have a big impact. This year, particularly so. And the main reason for that is the situation on Capitol Hill. The president that has come in has come in with razor thin majorities in both the Senate and the House. In fact, in the Senate, it is literally a 50-50 split with only the vice president breaking a tie. In that situation, it's unlikely that the president will be able to pass major policy initiatives through legislation. So the president naturally is going to default, we believe, to the branch of government that he controls, which is the executive branch, and the administrative agencies that are part of it. This is where we expect to see the major policy initiatives and this is what we are planning to respond to. So which areas are you most concerned about and why? Well, there are many. Uh, there's quite a few areas that we are keeping an eye on, but front and center are issues involving the dealer finance office. And chief among those are issues involving dealer participation. That is the dealer's portion of the finance charge of the APR that they earn when they originate a finance contract and also voluntary protection products. They have been under the gun by consumer advocacy groups for a long time, and actually two of the five FTC commissioners in 2020 made public statements that strongly suggest they will pursue a rule to eliminate dealer participation at the earliest opportunity. We are very concerned about that because those two Democratic commissioners are gonna be joined by a third as a result of the president and we are very concerned about it because the way the commission is structured, there are five FTC commissioners, three from the president's party, two from the opposition party, and the two Democratic commissioners that made statements hostile to dealer participation will soon be joined by a third Democratic commissioner. If that person is similarly disposed, we could have a real challenge on our hands. And keep in mind, that is just from the Federal Trade Commission. Recall that the CFPB under Richard Cordray was trying to achieve the same result through the jurisdiction it can exercise over banks to get them to change their contracts and the way they compensate dealers for originating a finance contract. So we can see pressure from both the Federal Trade Commission as well as the CFPB, and that of course will be a very monumental challenge. Wow. Well, what is NADA doing to respond to these possibilities? Well, fortunately, we have been very active in responding, and we've been quite active for a long time. So the first thing you do when you're faced with agencies that have a predisposition to issue a rule that would affect the entire agency is you try to come up with a solid, credible, market-based alternative. Something that if they look at, they will say, maybe it's not necessary for us to take this drastic action. Now, we have done that with both dealer participation and voluntary protection products. In 2014, we rolled out with NAMAD and AIADA our optional dealership fair credit compliance policy and program. And in 2019, we did the same with a model policy for voluntary protection products. Now, these are very well regarded. Attorneys across the nation have spoken very positively about them. They've been endorsed by many dealer compliance companies, and indeed, many dealer finance sources have expressed quite a bit of support for them and urged dealers to take a strong look at adopting them for their dealerships. In addition, several things happened recently to assist in obtaining widespread support for these two policies. In August 2020, the American Bar Association overwhelmingly passed a resolution endorsing our Fair Credit Compliance Program. In fact, it urged government at all levels to include the federal government 
to recognize a dealer's faithful implementation of the Fair Credit Compliance Program as being a safe harbor against pricing discrimination claims. Now that is huge. They're a very influential group and they said it very emphatically in a resolution that they passed. And even more recently, just last month in January, a task force appointed by CFPB Director Kathy Craniger that was looking at ways to improve federal consumer financial law made the same recommendation. They thought that dealers that faithfully implement the program should have the safe harbor protection. So we've developed the alternative tools, we have very broad scale support for it, and we are meeting directly with the regulators. We are asking them to revisit their assumptions that lead them to go in this direction in the first place. And if they insist on doing something in this arena, look at these much more common sense approaches than a blunt rule that applies to all 17,000 dealers regardless of their situation. We hope they'll take a serious look at it. We think the support of these different groups will be very helpful in that regard, and we will remain very vigilant in this effort. That's really interesting, Paul. Thank you. What are some other areas of concern? Well, I wish I could say that that's all there was uh, that involves the finance office. However, there are really several other areas of concern. Very briefly, one is risk-based pricing. Today, the whole reason you have so many credit sources for credit challenge consumers is that finance sources are allowed to charge a risk premium to high risk credit customers. If they have defaults, if they have delinquencies, bankruptcies, those type of things, in order to extend financing to someone that presents that type of risk, finance companies are allowed to charge a risk premium to manage the losses that they inevitably will incur. That actually is under threat as well. And we are working with the Chamber of Commerce to push back on any efforts to try to eliminate or restrict risk-based pricing. And it goes on. The CFPB and the Federal Reserve Board are both involved in an effort to implement Section 1071 of the Dodd-Frank Act. That is something that's gonna require dealers and other financial institutions. When they get a credit application, from a small business, a woman-owned business, or a minority-owned business to take a series of steps to collect data and report it to the federal government and retain it and do several other actions. It will be enormously burdensome. Dealers have been temporarily exempt from this for 10 years. That's not gonna last forever. The agencies are moving forward to put out a proposed rule. We wanna make sure when they do it, it's something that dealers can manage. And that's a good segue to the issue of the FTC safeguards rule. As we sit here today, there is currently proposed by the Federal Trade Commission an amendment to the safeguards rule. And this amendment would require any financial institution to include auto dealers in addition to everything they're doing today to protect customer information to have to institute a series of new technological minimums now, we conducted some research on what this would cost the average size dealership, and the figure they came back with was close to $300,000 in upfront cost, and nearly that much every year thereafter to maintain compliance with this new mandate. If that were to become finalized, that would be hugely problematic. An agency that wants to take the right steps, and clearly the FTC is well-intentioned in this regard, has to do it in a way that is manageable for businesses. And just like with Section 1071, our message to the agencies is simply going to be, when you come forward with a compliance scheme, it needs to be something that a small business dealer can manage. Otherwise, it defeats the entire effort. So there are a lot of challenges, but we are very active in responding to them. That's great information, Paul. In the tax arena, how has the pandemic affected dealers on LIFO? Well, for some dealers, it's affecting them quite a bit, and it's a huge concern. Now, remember, if you're on LIFO, that is an accounting method for your new vehicle inventories, typically you can be confronted with having to take money into income during periods of deflation or periods of significant inventory drops. And we know from 20 group data many dealers have encountered very significant inventory drops. And for some of them, they are really looking at the prospect of a huge tax bill. 
So we are trying to do whatever we can to try to mitigate or soften that impact. Now, one thing any dealer in that situation should do is they should tune into a webinar we put on by the dealer accounting firm Crow. We did this on December 8th, and they talk about what you can do under existing provisions of the Internal Revenue Code to try to manage this issue. There's no silver bullet, but nevertheless, there are some very helpful guidance. Now, in addition to that, we would like more complete relief. So we are seeking from the Department of Treasury authority under Section 473 of the Internal Revenue Code for the Secretary of the Treasury to state that a major foreign trade disruption has occurred that should allow dealers to move back their end of year inventory date to a time when hopefully their inventory supply will be replenished and they will not face this dilemma. The problem is it's a big lift. The reason it's a big lift, Section 473 has been around for 40 years and it never once has been utilized to support taxpayers. So there certainly is no precedent for it. It's not something that's likely to occur. Nevertheless, we are deploying a lot of resources and energy in trying to get Treasury to actively consider this remedy. And we are hopeful that if it's provided, it will give very meaningful relief to auto and truck dealers across the country. Where can we learn more about these topics? Well, these and many other topics will be addressed at various times during the show. Uh, two programs that are specifically designed on the issues we've talked about. One is Explore Hot Tax Topics with Industry Experts. This is where three seasoned CPAs that work with dealers on the ground all the time and in large numbers, they talk about the developments in the last year in the federal income tax arena, and there have been many, and they also talk about what the transition could mean. So they'll do that on the tax front, and then Doug Greenhouse and I will do our annual federal regulatory update for car dealers, where we look at an array of issues, including many of the ones I just touched on. That was all so informative. Thank you so much for your time, Paul. Thank you as well. Paul, thanks so much for adding your perspective to what's always an important and engaging topic for dealers. Paul, we respect your team. We respect the work you've been doing. Keep it up now more than ever. <laughs>